it's a little ironic uh, to be giving a talk about science and not being able to work the computer, but <laughs> there it is. Um, how you guys doing? Ooh. How you guys doing? All right. Well, it's last but not least, and uh, I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but uh, I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, thanks, first of all, for being invited, for everyone who was uh, responsible for that decision, and uh, I'm really blessed to be here. It's my first visit to your beautiful campus. I really enjoyed taking a look around, walking around today, so everyone should feel blessed. Uh, this conference, do you know what it's called? Faith in the Humanities. All right, so what would faith in the humanities or in literary studies actually look like? Or in our writing lives? For that matter, faith in our relationships, our hobbies, our teaching, our study habits, Okay, let's see what the next slide is. I'm kind of curious. Right, so this is a little weird here. Oh, yeah, I got one up here. So the subtitle of my talk is uh, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It's a classic study by the late, great Eugene Peterson, who actually just passed away a couple months ago. If you want to learn about spirituality, he would be one of my first recommendations. His books are great. Uh, words like obedience, discipline, they are not the most popular words in our culture today. The irony of the yoke metaphor, which is used by Jesus, he calls it light. Our yoke is, my yoke is light, he says. In fact, it is a yoke, right? You ever thought about that one? How can something restraining us and yoking us lead ultimately to completeness? and liberation. It's an irony, isn't it? That's our riddle today. So the subtitle describes the kinds of things that we choose to devote the better parts of our lives to. The same direction suggests also that sometimes it, it can become dull or routine or mundane or boring. But again, there's no shortcuts. So I'm gonna to return to Peterson's phrase and his account of the spiritual in a couple minutes. First, I'll begin by talking a little bit about my current project, which is called Spiritual Blink, in which I try to make connections between some of the things we're learning about the brain and some of the things that we've always known about the spiritual disciplines. Nowadays, I teach a regular class for upperclassmen that's called Spirituality and Literature. And the first week, I usually end up asking students, uh, first of all, I often say, how many of you consider yourselves spiritual? Let's just see a show of hands, by the way. How many of you would say, I'm spiritual? Wow, not many. Oh, some of you are doing the, the postmodern shuffle here. I don't know, define it, right? That's what they, so I say, well, you define it. Especially you that raised your hands. I'll say to those students, okay, you, you, you raised your hand, right? Yeah. When you say you're spiritual, what does it mean? Don't answer that. It's a rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to define the term. It's a tough word in our culture today. Of course, it's the first word in the title of the book that I'm working on, Spiritual Blink. So let me just say here very briefly, can we go to the next slide? The New Testament calls us to be spiritual beings. That's right. A spiritual being is one who is led by the Spirit, listens to the Spirit, and walks by the Spirit. It's a Pauline term. The Greek word that is translated as spiritual is pneumatikos. Most Christians don't have a very clear understanding of how it's used, though. They tend to think of the spiritual part and the body part. That's called dualism. But actually, the way that Paul uses the term a spiritual being is driven by the Spirit in the same way that a sailboat is driven by the wind. Do you listen to the Spirit? Do you see your life as being driven by the Spirit of God in the same way that a sailboat is driven by the wind? Well, we're all working on it, hopefully, right? That's what it means in the Bible to be spiritual. Do you consider your mind to be fully 
woke to the spirit, <laughs> sensitive to the spirit's comings and goings. This is the biblical account of the spiritual life. It's an account of Christian salvation as ongoing conversion or sanctification, which is a Wesleyan term. It's lifelong. It's a rigorous process of becoming better at being a virtuous human. It's like the difference between a wedding and a marriage. Although a wedding technically, there's the postmodern quotation, <laughs> and legally makes you a spouse, you will find out pretty quickly that there's more involved. Okay, so next slide. Marriage is another, quote, long obedience in the same direction. It's a yoke. Usually when you, if you Google image yoke, you will usually see two oxen. There's two in a yoke, okay? Or marriage can become a great failure of long obedience in the same direction. My talk today is aimed at developing what I call a spirituality of writing. I want us to think briefly together about what it would mean to become a writer led by the Spirit. I can assure you that it is no easy task. To prepare for this meeting in my life over the last few years, I've read many powerful and challenging books on a variety of topics related to this, maybe all or parts of hundreds of books over several years. Each of these books reflects the devotion and the perseverance of the author, as well as the support, the network, the family and friends surrounding that author. So think about what goes into just a talk like this. Much of, most of it actually not even done by me, first of all. So for example, over the past few weeks, next slide is a picture of Christina Bieber Lake's excellent book, Prophets of the Post-Human. You may know that term, the post-human. It's an interesting idea. While the book is a remarkable achievement, and it reflects many years of Christina's effort, but it also impressed upon me how one scholarship actually reveals the mind and the heart of the scholar, the writer, the painstaking years of study and contemplation that are required to produce it. She's also a professor. So her book is a concrete example reflecting hundreds of hours in the classroom, talking with students, hundreds and hundreds of hours reading the papers of students and trying to think of something useful to say about the paper. It's a careful record of a certain kind of life of the mind over long periods of time. It's precisely the kind of deep, soulful, intellectual life that I am here tonight to advocate. I hope my novel does a little of that too. Walt Whitman said it this way about his own masterpiece, Leaves of Grass. Can you guys read that in the back? Camarado, this is no book. Who touches this touches a man. It's really a chill, a kind of a wonderful way to think about a book, okay? It also reminds me of one of my favorite lines from Roger Lundin's work, reflecting on his biography of Emily Dickinson. He says, quote, the difficulty of writing a biography had to do with challenges unique to the craft. It's one thing to analyze a woman's poetry or ideas. It's quite another to cradle her life in your hands. You hear that? Isn't that a beautiful way to think about the kind of uh, relationship that one can actually develop with the object of study? It could be Dickinson, it could be Mark Twain, it could be butterflies, it could be geological ages, it could be anything that you cradle it, you take it so seriously and it's so sacred. Imagine that tonight such wonder and vulnerability. Well, I want, to I want to claim tonight that this awesome potential, this level of the life of the mind as an author or a teacher is presently available to everyone here. Yes. Let it sink in for a moment. Because today, each of us is cradling 
our own brains in our hands. Yes, our brains, I said. <laughs> okay, so due to the revolutionary insights that are available through recent scanning technologies, especially MRIs, the brain's amazing plasticity, keyword tonight, neuroplasticity or plasticity, it's constantly evolving. Did you know that your brain, when you leave here tonight, will be physically different yes. from when you walked in the room? Yes. I don't mean you'll have new ideas. I mean it will physically leave an imprint in your physical neurons, in your brain. It's constantly evolving. That's what plasticity means. This amazing uh, element of the brain is now established scientific fact, and you can switch, that is affording intriguing implications to scholars in the liberal arts. It's called neuroplasticity, and it means the brain's ability to reform and rewire itself through experience, habit, practice. It tells us that we humans have the ability to alter and reprogram our own brains through habit and practice. And it has spiritual implications as well, given the fact that a desire to alter and reprogram ourselves through habit is considered the main goal of human spirituality. Neuroscientist Norman Deutsch claims this, the idea that the brain can change its own strong structure and function through activity is, I believe, the most important alteration in our view of the brain since we first sketched out its basic anatomy. Until very recently, we've not really fully grasped the brain's resources. Maybe we still don't, as in the recent Scarlett Johansson film, Lucy, where a young girl is given explosive new drugs, experimental drugs that expand the brain's abilities exponentially. Well, back here in reality, however, if we consider the number of possible neural circuits we're dealing with hyper-astronomical numbers, approximately 10 followed by at least a million zeros. According to Deutsch, quote, these staggering numbers explain why the human brain can now be described as the most complex known object in the physical universe. Your brain, right? There are theistic scientists like Kurt Thompson in his book, Anatomy of the Soul, where he insists that God changes us literally, physically, through the alterations of our neural network. Quote, as Christians, we sometimes dismiss our physical experience as inferior to the abstract or the spiritual part of our consciousness where we imagine or think about spiritual matters. Yet Paul describes our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit, which is a habitation. So clearly our bodies are involved in our deepest spiritual experience. This comment reflects one of the biggest issues in these related fields right now. Are humans primarily dualistic beings made up of a mind and a body, or a soul, or a spirit. And by the way, what's the difference between soul, spirit, mind? Good questions. Or the emerging position of a lot of people is called Christian physicalism. Can the mind even exist outside of a body? I'm not going to solve that one tonight, but it's <laughs> worth thinking about. And it has important implications in terms of what we're learning about the brain. Precisely how does God change us? How many of you believe that the Bible teaches that God changes us? Have you heard that before? How does he do it? Well, there are stock theological answers. If someone asked you that, what would you say? But how does God change you? What do you think the, the typical lightweight uh, answer is to that one? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> right, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Or, how about the grace of God? Good trump card. Boom! <laughs> Snap! Grace of God. Or, the Roman Catholic version. You ready? It's all a mystery. 
<laughs> I love all those answers, but I have another one tonight, okay? What if the neuroplasticity of the brain turns out to be precisely how God changes us, physically? What if that's the design, actually? What if the change is in us? Now think about it. Does Scripture say anything about that? What if the human brain, the most complex an amazing physical attribute of humanity is precisely the site of our salvation and sanctification. As the Bible describes salvation, think about the metaphors it uses. Or are they metaphors? Right? God is at work in us. In us. Physically. Not in our spirits or whatever those things are. But physically is at work in us. God transforms or washes our minds. Be, be, the, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, right? Maybe we can even participate in the divine nature. Or how about that last one? Simple but elegant. I am in you. You ever thought about what that actually means? It's like I have gas in my gas tank. The gas is in the gas tank. You get it? I am in you. Maybe the brain is doing is this site for this kind of change. Maybe our bodies are literally, physically, a habitation of the Holy Spirit, a temple. So the first thing I'm suggesting is that God's plan is to be at work in us physically, in our bodies, in our central nervous systems, together with us, in concert with us. Second, I want to mention some related studies in a specialized field of developmental psychology. This area, this is a fairly new area, the last 20 years or so, it's usually called performance studies or expert studies. You may, have, you may have actually read some of the stuff in these areas. And it argues for the power of habits and disciplines to literally, again, physically, you know, students love to say literally, I really mean it, though. It's literally <laughs> transforming our brains. Okay? By the way, did I mention your bad habits are, all, are also literally transforming your brain? Just think about it. So it doesn't matter if they're good habits or bad habits. Sorry. Okay, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> These neurologically based approaches have become a major area of interest lately, and their goal is to determine the ways and means of the production of talent and even genius. In our culture, in fact, the terms talent and genius are under scrutiny right now. But usually, um, usually we tend to think of talent or genius as being in the DNA or in the genes or you're just born with it or that person has a gift, yada, yada. You know the narrative, right? What if that's not true? What if talent is about observed effects rather than causes of something. What if you can actually create talent? Wow. Or genius, even. Think about that. I'd like to suggest that everyone here today probably underestimates vastly their own potential for goodness or even greatness. We underestimate it because of certain cultural codes, common sense narratives about things like talent, genius, or even Christianity which says that saints or heroes or spiritual geniuses are special, called, anointed. They're just made a certain way. You can't really be like Jesus. You can't really live like that. Right? I want to challenge that view. A decade ago, you can see the next slide shows Blink, which is my book called Spiritual blink. Oh, I forgot about uh, Albert on there. That's a good quote. Now remember, this is just a patent, patent clerk. You know, most of the great geniuses, when they were your age, nobody said, genius. That's right. That's right. They weren't. Yeah. It's very unusual. You don't know. That's why I said to Benjamin, send me an email in 10 years. I want to see how this turns out, man. <laughs> right? He was a patent guy. Riding around on the tram, you know. Now in Blink, 
The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. Has anyone read the link? Malcolm Gladwell, about 10 years ago. A very famous book, about 12 years ago. It was one of the first books to argue that great decision makers, great artists, aren't those who are simply born with certain gifts, but they've perfected the art of what he called thin slicing reality, filtering the very few factors that matter from an overwhelming number of variables, fostered especially through extensive practice. In his next book, Outliers, Gladwell sets out his 10,000 hour rule. Has anyone heard that one? The 10,000 hour rule by which he refers to evidence, and there's a lot of evidence, indicating that something crucial happens in the brain when a person mindfully commits 10,000 hours of what's called deliberate practice to a particular activity, usually over about nine or 10 years, which works out to about 1,000 hours a year, which roughly is about three to five hours a day, okay? This concept actually came from a guy called Anders Ericsson, but Gladwell popularized it in America. Whether it's music or chess or such a task as Hemingway's desire to create true sentences, it appears that desire and passion combined with sheer willpower in the form of thousands of hours of practice is the key to bringing about unusual level, levels of expertise. So beyond Blink, expert studies now, a decade, full decade later, they're suggesting it's not our genes. It's not inborn talent or genius. Maybe you were in advanced placement in high school. <laughs> Very overrated. It's a kind of a false thing that a lot of our education system wants to make it simpler than it really is. A lot of the study has been on the usual suspects that have been called born geniuses. If I asked you to name some of those, I suppose you would say some of the most famous examples, right? Who's someone where you go, oh, it's just a born genius? You know, Mozart, Beethoven, we saw Einstein, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, maybe Emily Dickinson, maybe whoever. Maybe even Ernest Hemingway. But when you study their lives, what you find is, it's not something like what was born into them, but it's the way they lived their lives and the yes. way they emerged. That actually, when they were younger, except in a few key, you know, Michelangelo, we think, well, God, he did these, I mean, you go, to, you go to Florence, you see those statues, he was very young, he wasn't much older than you, but he had been apprenticing for about 10 years, mm. working 14, 16 hour days, right? you know, leading up to that. The results suggest that it may be that these terms are more about effects. One implication is that our individual stewardship, our manipulation of our own brains, including alterations, can allow us to find this expertise. But also such things as joy, happiness, by means of repetitive activities. As we immerse ourselves in the various deliberate practices, our brains support and insulate the neural pathways with what's called myelin, sometimes now called the white matter of the brain as opposed to the gray matter. It's like insulation on a wire. We actually learn to identify and make those habits pleasurable because it releases endorphins and other brain chemicals. So that's why if you've ever done anything for like eight weeks or 10 weeks or three months and it, it begins to become almost addictive, and again, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. That's because the brain is learning to make that uh, pleasurable to you. That's why it's so hard to break free from addictions. Habits release chemicals. They can increase satisfaction, well-being, joy. What we first think is boring can end up becoming addictive. And these activities over time, sometimes relatively short amounts of time, like eight weeks or three months, literally, will change our brains. This is a game changer for people like you and me. We're all regular folks, just like Hemingway and Mozart and those others. But there is a downside. It places full responsibility for our lives directly into our hands. Those of our parents and our other peers and teachers, the ones who guide us, mostly, especially in the early years for things like literacy, vocabulary, 
and even IQ, which we're now learning is mostly about the culture in which a child is raised. Okay. Scholars are busy studying the ways that great achievers are able to accomplish their tasks. I'm going to turn to that here in just a minute. The upshot of all this is empowering to us. If we're willing to pay a price, we can achieve great things. Hemingway is a perfect example. So how do we utilize this information about the brain? In our own attempts to become a good writer, for example, what's this have to do with faith? Right? In intriguing ways, memoirs by writers often resemble forms of spiritual writing insofar as they urge concentration on some aspect of the holy, and they disdain distractions and colonization by this word. Right now in the literature, you may be aware of this, but one of the big words is distraction. How many of you are itching to check your text messages right now? So these are, these are real uh, things in the conversation right now. Right now. Because the, in terms of writing or art or music or just about any professional skill that you hope to achieve, a major goal is going to reach a height is to, is to reach a heightened state of meditative focus, a state that is largely achievable through mindful practice. Another big word nowadays, mindfulness. You know, training our minds, the fruit of sustained habit. Sometimes there's even a more heightened state that's being called today the sweet spot or the zone. You may have heard this on ESPN. Or or in a, in a sports situation where, you know, an athlete, they play, they play, they play, or a musician, you do gigs, you do gigs, but some nights, you just enter that zone. There's a sweet spot, and it's different. Or someone, you, you know, I remember when Michael Jordan got sick, and he had 104, and he came out on the court, and he, it was like one of his great, he was just in this zone. And it's just like, you know, he's always good, but some nights, wow. The zone phenomenon has probably been most commonly used with the athletes, but it, it relates to artists and scientists, even teachers in the classroom. I teach classes. You know, we all teach classes every day, right? And they're just classes, and they're, they can be good, but then sometimes something happens in the classroom, and maybe as a student you've had that experience, right? It can also be used to describe the special occasions of the mystics. Have you ever, are, are you praying every day, for example? Maybe they, they want you to, and you go, oh, it's boring, I don't want to pray. But then, you know, if you pray and you pray, and then some days you enter that zone, right? right? Okay, so you're with me. We develop grit, we develop passion, and artistic and spiritual practice can both be used as a pragmatic understanding of how we might, over a long period of time, change our brains in order to up the odds of achieving that sweet spot, that place where real creativity and even genius can emerge. Where are we at on our slides? Let's go forward one more. Oh, Got Grit? There's a great new book now that you can order if you want to read it over the summer. summer it's called Grit. Have you heard of that one? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a TED Talk. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. That's a word that, that's actually a kind of an older word. It's a 19th century word. Um, anyway, let's move on to um, a movable feast, okay? There it is. Great book. Yeah. Highly recommended. Hemingway articulates in this book a model of how a true artist can become successful through discipline and habit. As in many spiritual classics, Hemingway insists that a true artist must above all resist distraction, a skill that one develops over time, like any skill. Hemingway's ascetic approach to writing reveals a strong, prescient illustration of many of the insights I'm talking about tonight from contemporary neuroscience. And so his ruthless practice suggests an awareness of the brain's remarkable capacities to change itself. If it's true, one approach to reading Hemingway's memoir is to digest the author's powerful late in life account of how one might achieve a more prosperous and hopeful view of the future. One that he can pass on to young people 
like me and like you. I'm not so young anymore, but I was young when I read it. Now this is what happened. He was dying, he was getting old, he was feeling lousy, and he was uh, remembering those glory days in Paris 40 years earlier. I would say probably the happiest days of his life when he was beginning to achieve his greatness as a writer. In that sense, a movable feast becomes a kind of wisdom literature. It's generative and pedagogical in nature. And we should attend to the way that Hemingway describes what he calls a way of living well and working, no matter how poor you were, which was like having a great treasure given to you. Hemingway, now I don't know if you're, I could ask you, do you how many of you think of your 40 or 50 years of work that is ahead of you as this great treasure? But that, I, you, know, you can have that view. Yeah. This is the key. You want to find something where that's true. Because work is not a, it's not a, you know, it's not bad. It's good. Yeah. Right? Hemingway's statement about treasure reminds me of Jesus' account of the kingdom of God, as in, for example, Matthew 13. His gesture toward a way of living well, you may have heard of this cat, Socrates, and the account of the good life, right? So there's a kind of spiritual resonance to those lines. In both of these cases, Hemingway, his quote redounds with a hopefulness that trumps everything he tells us about 1920s Paris or anywhere else. Because what he is most interested in talking about is the future and not the past. Tellingly, many of the most beautiful passages in the book describe and urge this basic pattern. A certain monastic style characterizes his method as an author, as well as the book's most breathtaking scenes. One encounters in these passages a piety during which the reader observes moments where Hemingway is able to enter into sustained periods of anointed work a phenomenon that I've already talked about as the sweet spot, or the zone. He tends to call it luck. His term is, some days you just get lucky. Okay. He enters the zone, characterizes those flashes of his best writing in that way, consisting of moments of heightened production. His magical zone is the space where the habits of thousands of hours of craftsmanship uh, that allow a thin slicing of creativity when an inspired true artist creates something new and exciting. We might compare Hemingway's account to Louisa May Alcott's description of the vortex that a writer occasionally, if she's lucky, can enter. Or she calls it the writing fit, which strikes me as a very 19th century phrase. Like it's almost like a psychological or epileptic kind of fit. The idea of a fit, though, is something happens that's not even in your control. You ever seen like Michael Jordan would loop around and do that layup and they go, how'd you do this? Like, I don't know, I just, they just did it. It's thinking without thinking, or it's precognitive. Let's take a look at, uh, what's the next slide? Yeah, the zone. So li listen to that one, right? Isn't that beautiful? The story was writing itself, and I was having a hard time keeping up with it. The story was writing itself. What is that? It's the zone, right? Then I went back to writing, and I entered far into the story. I was lost in it. it I was writing it now, and it was not writing itself, and I didn't look up nor know anything about the time, nor think where I was, uh, nor I didn't even have a drink. Okay. I'll tell you, it was serious. Right. So, after years of practice, habitual practice, he can find that zone. And then he celebrates the good things. He always celebrates. That's uh, the benediction kind of thing. Well, anyway, overall, movable feast will document his, his conviction that there is a way of living well and working. Unrelated to how much money we have, and he considers this revelation to be nothing less than a great treasure. He was old. He was dying. He was struggling with alcohol and P PTSD 
And he probably even had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the concussion disease in the news recently regarding pro football players. But writing about Paris, right at the end of his life, it seemed to revive him. And that moral claim is precisely how he ends the book. Is that one on the next slide? It might be. Let's see what it says. There's never any ending to Paris. Paris was always worth it, and you received return for whatever you brought to it. But this is how Paris was in the early days when we were very poor and very happy. They weren't that poor, actually. Uh, his wife, Haley, her family had some money. But, you know, it, it sounds better, right? <laughs> Come on, you guys. That was, you know, that was at least a poor. <laughs> okay, so to do this, distraction becomes the bugaboo for Hemingway. It's actually now become a major enemy of contemporary work on this topic. Focus versus distraction. Since cell phones became ubiquitous about a decade ago, many of you have probably had a cell phone since you were 8 or 10 years old, right? Maybe your parents said no, no, no. No, 11. 11, okay. Now, by the way, with students, I've done a little bit of reading about this, but almost every student in college today admits several things. They admit that they are on their phone too much. But they also say, but my friends are worse. <laughs> you ready? For, I got some more good ones. You ready? 90% of students sleep with their phones. Whoa. 80 or 90, I don't remember the exact number, maybe 80 or 90% of students, the last thing they do at night and the first thing they do in the morning is check their phones. What? What? Not here, of course. <laughs> University of Washington, those people. <laughs> yeah. And at my school, they did a study a couple years ago of the freshmen, and they found that 70% of freshmen spoke to one of their parents every day their first semester. Now, I, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but folks, when I went to college, I'll see you at Christmas. <laughs> That's it. It's been real. Love you, Mom. You can leave. Ho, ho, ho. I'll see you in the summer. I don't know where this is going. <laughs> Let me just say this about cell phones. The, the research is extensive, folks. It's changing our brains. Yes. And some of you want to be writers, some of you want to be artists, some of you want to do this, do that. And you're going to have to tame that wild beast. Yeah. And most of you know it. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to move <laughs> to the end. It's, it's hurting. Oh, I got another one for you, especially guys. Really changing dating slash courting. And I hate to break it to you, but we were better at that, too. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Amen. Honestly, you're not wrong. Social skills. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm moving away from that. <laughs> but that thing is changing our brains, and that means it's changing us. It's physically changing us. So be, uh, be alert to that. I actually say in here... For today's lecture, I will spare you my diatribes about your phones. But I guess I, I, guess I just can not do that. Did I? Darn. But if you want to read Moby Dick, or the Brothers Karamazov, or try reading the Old Testament, or try doing a scientific experiment that will take three years, you're going to have to develop your focus and concentration. And it's like lifting weights. Your brain will do what you ask it to do. All right, moving forward here. Let's see where we're at in the slides. Yeah, so I'm going to end by talking a little bit about Christina's book, and here's a great quote. She teaches Gilead. Do you guys know that book? Yeah. It's a real masterpiece. It's very calm, and she's talking about this thing called the acceleration of tranquility, and actually how we've gotten away from things like tranquility and solitude, and these are very formative especially for spiritual practice, but I would say for the life of the mind. It's a common theme in our culture today to talk about distraction and it's a, the, the effects on our physical brains. But when she teaches Gilead, she found that it offered a peaceable experience 
compared to postmodern roller coasters like Snow Crash or Neuromancer, not to mention all of the kind of comic book movies that are full of just constant motion or Ready Player One or that kind of thing that's just kind of wow. But she writes this, reading it felt like sitting still in a meadow after riding on a high-speed train. Isn't that a great line? And then she claims, because it resists the acceleration of tranquility, Gilead is actually a countercultural novel. I like that term. To read it is to believe that it's possible to actually choose to live in tranquility. It, it's possible to learn to live without Instagram, or Twitter, or Tinder, or whatever it is that you're into. I know no one at this school uses Tinder, but I've heard <laughs> that at the University of Washington. <laughs> Some of you are going, Tinder, what's that? Google, yeah. what's Tinder? No. <laughs> That's wrecking relationships too, by the way. This is my belief too, though, that we need to believe in the possibility to choose to live counterculturally. In fact, as Christians, we're called to that. People are watching us. If you don't believe it, turn on the news. You want to be a good writer, you have to develop tranquility, contemplation, and what I call the life of the mind. It's a good old-fashioned term. According to much recent data, college students are also today filled with anxiety, the fear of missing out, the struggle with depression. Meanwhile, students often come to my office to talk about writing, and they're looking for what I call the microwave solution, the quick and easy solution. How can I get an A in your class? As opposed to, how do I become a better writer in five years than I am today? You know, it's like running a marathon race. You don't get out of bed one day and say, I'm going to run a marathon today, right? It's what Eugene Peterson called the tourist mindset. Everyone's in a hurry. The persons whom I lead in worship, among whom I counsel, visit, pray, preach, and teach, they want shortcuts. They're impatient for results. They have adopted the lifestyle of a tourist. They only want the high points. They want the Wikipedia version. You know? But the pastor is not a tour guide. The Christian life cannot be mature under such conditions and in such ways. And I would agree that the true life of the mind, or the life of a writer, is not a tourist life. Sadly, there just aren't shortcuts. Part of growing up is recognizing this, and learning that it is all a lifelong process. I wouldn't want to suggest that the answer is simply right thinking or anything like that. But we know for a fact that there are ways to work toward the alleviation of anxiety, for example. If you feel stressed out, if you feel anxiety, there are things we can do to become more peaceful or more patient in our lives, right? The fruit of the Spirit, by the way, how, it, it doesn't just go boom, joy, love. No, fruit grows on a tree and it grows over a long period of time right. and it ripens. Yes. And it's at the end when it's sweetest. If you see what I love, the image of the fruit. Some people, usually a student comes up afterwards, and, or maybe in the Q&A if they have the courage, and they'll say, well, you talk about joy, but I'm just not a joyful person. I just wasn't born that way. Oh, there's that narrative, though. Yeah. But you have agency over those things. <coughs> Otherwise, I don't believe the, the Bible would teach us that we can enjoy the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We can actually become more joyful people. That's right. We can do that. There are things we can do. Okay, we got to end. <laughs> that is a remarkable concept, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful to know that you can have joy or that you can have peace in an age, a frenetic age? I often tell people, my age or people with your parents, I think it's a really hard time to grow up. I actually think it's a lot harder for you guys than it was for us. I think if I had had a cell phone, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, you know, I think those are, you know, 
considerable hurdles for you, to be honest. But that's the gist of my talk today. So let me just finish by saying, uh, what? Oh, I guess I was going to read a little from my book. Where are we at on the time? When did I start? Yeah, I'm going to finish. I'm going to skip that. So you just have to buy the book. Or <laughs> read it, I guess. Which you can do afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, out on the plaza, right? <laughs> one of those guys. Uh, the first one, uh, well, let's see. Go back to that. I'll just say a couple things about it. Yeah, the, I bas basically chose these two tonight to kind of illustrate that the, there's a painstaking quality. You know, these teachers you have, uh, some of them are here tonight, and uh, Clint's back here, and they, they've devoted their lives to this. They're not kidding around, you know. They take this very seriously, as do I. You know, and I think that we owe people like that a lot of respect for, you know, what I'm trying to capture in something like this, I say the monastic tone. You know, it's not a, you know, campus is a very American word, by the way. The idea of a campus, let me think, I like, it's so beautiful. The trees out here, and I was talking to someone earlier and said, yeah, that's, I was like, open your eyes, dude, smell the coffee. This is so cool. This is like a set-apart place. It's a space that's set apart from the rest of the world where you can come and enjoy these years and build the life of mine. And it's really monastic in that sense. It's not, you know, all about, par of course, I went to some parties in college. I know it's a shocker, <laughs> but I did that too. But, uh, you know, it's more about, it's a place of formation. It's a beautiful thing. And then the next one, you know, this is about the kind of long-term friendship. He wrote this book called Epistolary Friendship. You know what that means? It's a friendship carried out in letters, back and forth, which, you know, I don't know if you, are you going to be, Holding on to your emails, because I have letters from when I first went to Japan, I have all my mother's letters in a file. And they were physical letters that she sent me. And those are tangible, you know, I, I published a volume of Mark Twain's letters with his best friend, Joe Twitchell. All of the letters over 40 years. You know that Mark Twain wrote 15 to 20 letters almost every day of his life? Physical letters. You know, you, that's a, a discipline. Now, you, now, I know that the studies show, I think with you guys, it's around 400 or so average number of texts per day. Now, maybe again, not here, but over there, <laughs> across the lake. You know, does that sound accurate? That's a different kind of communication, and it requires different kinds of stylistic and gramma grammatical types of <laughs> right, decisions that you make and so on and so forth. Okay, let me finish by just, uh, we're going to skip ahead, we're going to skip ahead to Hemingway. Writing was not a rec recreation, it was a way of life. Good quote. We're going to skip ahead <laughs> and we're going to get to Norman McLean. And there's that quote from Hemingway, a way of living well and working. And here's what Norman McLean says, and a river runs through it. Grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. <laughs> okay? But if we allow the disciplines to dominate our lives, the possibilities of grace are made available to us. Okay, that's it. I'm sticking with you. Thank you. Dr. Bush, are you happy fielding 15, sure. 20 minutes? Sure, absolutely. Questions? Okay, what, what 20, questions 30, do you have 40, for 40, 90. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Bush is generous with his time here. Oh, is there? So. What time's the basketball game? Um, 11, 9, 10, 11. Wow. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we've, we've got some time. What questions do you have for Dr. Bush? Yeah, if you need to leave, you know, feel free. No wisecracks? Nothing? <laughs> 